So I'm Milan Bandarkar. I'm a founder and CEO of a startup called Ampool. Uh, if you haven't heard about us, that's my fault. I'm the only marketing person here, and that's why I'm here to talk about it. All right. So uh, when we started Ampool, we basically started looking at what is the fundamental problem that is lacking in the data infrastructure that does not allow you to build modern data-driven applications, right? With the advent of mobile and everything else, you basically now have the users, even business users, expecting instant results, instant gratification, intelligent experiences from your applications that you are building. They want it to be based on all the data about you, right, uh, that the application has access to. And you basically need to uh, analyze this data. This needs to be powered by analytics. And uh, it is a well-known fact in the industry that you can derive more business value when you act on fresh data rather than years old or months old or days old data. Right? Uh, one of my mentors, Paul Maritz, executive chairman of Pivotal, actually uh, stated this very nicely. Right? Basically said that the companies need to catch the users in action catch their customers in the action, and actually do something and affect the outcome of their experience with your company, right? And Gartner has been talking about uh, the same thing, but in a, in a sort of more businessy way, uh, calling it a real-time enterprise, et cetera, et cetera. The core problem for building the real-time enterprise is the current context that you need to create from the data that is available to you in real time. And that is the main problem that we want to solve here. In the meanwhile, what happens, and this we have discovered with several customer conversations and prospect conversation, is that your data infrastructure is siloed into two parts. One is powering the applications, and that's where your Gemfire and, and Geode and caches and NoSQL systems and, and, and RDBMS, traditional RDBMS comes in. And then there is something in the back end called the data warehouse or the data lakes these days, be, uh, uh, increasingly being powered by Hadoop or some such thing. And these are basically used as you know, data repositories and then doing batch analytics and things like that. And at a minimum, what we found that most of the enterprises that we talked to, there is a 12 to 48 hours gap between something happening in the application and that data actually getting analyzed in the backend data store or the backend data warehouse. Right? Where is the time going? The time is going in data, getting data extracts. Uh, extracts the, the, the data staging environment just sitting on a dump filer or something like that. Uh, you're doing a lot of complex join, ETL, all that kind of uh, things. And that's, that's where most of the time is actually going in between those two silos. Right? So how do we bridge those two silos? Our uh, mission at Ampool is to eliminate these data blackout periods completely. The, the reason that I call this the data blackout period is that the data is there. It's lying somewhere is just not accessible to the application, period. Or the results of those analytics are not uh, uh, available to the applications. So we want to eliminate this data blackout period by bridging the gap between these two silos. Right? So uh, the, the three capabilities that are needed by, by these data-driven applications, which is fast ingestion of data, right? analyzing this data using best of breed engines, and I will talk about that later uh, once I get to the technical portion of my talk, uh, and then serving the data concurrently to these multiple applications which are trying to access that data. Combining all these three capabilities is important if we want to deliver the modern data-driven applications. Okay? So uh, there are plenty of solutions out there which are trying to do this. So what, does, uh, what differentiates Ample from the, uh, uh, from the rest? Right? We allow fast continu continuous ingestion, uh, enable uh, enable real-time updates, in-place real-time updates, rather than creating extra copies of your data. Eliminate the batch ETL completely, because we are a lookup-based system, right? And we allow memory speed analytics. Now, that's all enough marketing jargon out there. Let's talk about how we do it, right? So the three major capabilities, as we discussed, that are required by these modern data-driven applications is, first of all, these applications are generating a huge data exhaust. This data exhaust needs to be carried away from the application, stored into some sort of a persistent store, maybe uh, NoSQL systems, or HDFS, or cloud S3, uh, uh, like object stores, or whatever. And then, all this data exhaust that is coming from the applications needs to be analyzed. 
Now, in the analytics, you basically use you know, modern tools like Spark or just use plain Java or your SQL systems or whatever. And increasingly, you are doing more adaptive machine le- or, or more adaptive technologies such as machine learnings and stuff like that. Right? And then the results of those analytics needs to be persisted back and then served into the applications. Right? You realize the, 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 the process here. And in order to serve the results of these analytics back to the applications, you will typically use something like Redis or something like that as a caching layer. Right? What Ampool tries to do is eliminate all these different stages in this entire analytics pipeline, making it a closed loop analytics. Right? The data that is exhaust from the application goes straight into Ampool where it can be analyzed, and where the results of the analytics also going into Ampool and then served back from Ampool directly into the applications, thereby closing the loop in the analytics, so allowing closed loop analytics on real-time data that is getting uh, uh, generated by these applications. Okay? Uh, obviously, uh, in order to do this properly, uh, we have extended Apache Geode, because uh, my previous job was at, at Pivotal, and uh, very familiar with Gemfire and Gemfire XD, knew the mission critical nature of the deployments and the, the capability of the technology. So it was a natural choice for us to extend Apache Geode. So Apache Geode, as you know, is an in-memory data grid. Uh, so all the aspects, all the heavy lifting of building a distributed system, we actually directly borrow from Apache Geode. Okay? It has been designed with low latency uh, as its main feature, as a key value store, as an object store. Right? What we add are all these dark blue boxes that you see here. First thing that we noticed is that a lot of these applications are generating semi-structured data. We need to keep track of what kind of data is getting generated, how it is distributed, what are the pre-aggregates or aggregates that are typically used in analytics applications. All of that are in the extensible metadata and catalog store. The second thing is, not all the data is going to be fitting in memory, right? We have, uh, you know, my last 12 years of experience has been uh, as a Hadoop architect, uh, uh, starting with Yahoo. So we actually did a lot of analysis on the amount of data that we were managing. So we have uh, come up with with, with a a distribution, 11089, right? 1% of the data needs to be acted upon immediately. 10% 10% of the data may be once a day, it's a warm data, and then 89% of data is typically very cold, right? So that one plus 10 is what we are targeting Ampool for. The 89% of the data which gets you know, analyzed quarterly or annually or whatever, that can remain in HDFS or S3 or any of those stores. So for that, we need very smart tiering. We need to actually track the usage of data when it is getting used, when it is going to be used, we need to some, do some sort of a prediction, right? And move the data between these two, these, these two or three tiers. So that smart data tiering technology we have added onto, uh, uh, on top of Geode, right? Uh, low latency communications we are already familiar with in Apache Geode. We added high throughput communication. Very different design points, but then we can actually make it, uh, uh, you know, both low latency and high throughput is very difficult. As, as a lot of people uh, probably know, uh, but we have uh, uh, managed to at least separate those out, right, and added high throughput communication. And the main thing is, uh, other than regions, or in addition to regions, we act- actually added the table abstractions, right? So Christian was talking about data federation, as in tables remain somewhere and then regions get exposed as, as tables. We actually added the support for tables inside of Geode itself, right? And I'll be talking more about that. So one of the first things that we did is took Apache Geode, right, and uh, tried to modularize it as much as possible, splitting it into seven layers. You might have heard about OSI seven-layer model. So I, I, I'm very, you know, uh, 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 <laughs> I really like that seven-layer model. So seven layers, one on top of each other, with clearly separated APIs, where each one of these layers can be extended independently. Right? That's the main, main contribution that we did, to, and, and we will be contributing that back to Apache Geode uh, in order to do the modular, modularization. So uh, one of the example use cases from our customer, they were the, the, the before and after state, you can basically take a look at it. You know, they were using, uh, so the data was coming through REST and MQTT, and obviously with MQTT you understand that this is an IoT customer, industrial IoT customer. 
obviously all of this data was getting accumulated into some sort of a staging buffer before the buffer fills up then the data would go into sdfs some sort of a spark query that was doing a machine learning anomaly detection job was actually building models off of that sdfs data every hour and then the model will be you know imported from the uh, sdfs uh, using a custom java program put it into MongoDB, and obviously nobody serves MongoDB to the applications directly, so they added Redis on top of that, and then the applications will be pulling data from there, right? All those blue boxes that you see, the dark blue boxes, they removed it with Ample, right? REST and MQTT directly pushes data into Ample, right? Now, rather than waiting for the staging buffer to fill up and then get into HDFS, the Spark job can run as often as one minute or 10 minutes or five minutes, right? Whatever you want. All the results go back to the Ample itself. They don't have to be carried over to some other system. And then all the application uh, uh, outputs, endpoints, visualization, alerts, et cetera, could be supported directly from Ample, right? One of the things that I haven't shown here is a dotted line back from Ample into HDFS so that if they need, if the customer needs uh, the data for the last three years, it is actually available inside of HDFS, right? Okay. So we are a horizontal platform. We are targeting multiple verticals and use cases, right? Financial services seems to be our sort of the sweet spot uh, as of now, but we have been used in uh, media, we have been used in retail, uh, we have been used in, in IoT, et cetera, okay? So obviously, performance is the most critical thing other than reducing complexity, right? So this is actually a comparison with uh, AgeBase, and AgeBase is one of the fastest NoSQL stores out there. So you can see easily three to 10x uh, uh, speed ups or three to six x speed ups in terms of throughput, right? Inter, uh, between Ampool and HBase, right? Uh, but how does it basically perform on the analytical side, right? So the first part was essentially serving how many clients can connect simultaneously to, to the Ampool store, but analytical queries, so uh, a customer of ours actually gave us the 10 analytical queries that uh, they were running on top of HBase. Right? So we made it run on top of uh, uh, Ampool, and you can see 3x to you know, 10x uh, improvements on the analytical side. Now, obviously, you will say that, obviously, HBase is a disk-based store. So disk versus memory, how are you comparing that? Well, HBase, over the last year, has added in-memory option for storage. So you just need to say minus in-memory equals true. All these comparisons that I'm showing you between HBase and Ampool are actually done with HBase in-memory and Ampool in-memory. Right? So not all in-memory platforms are created equal. That's the, that's the takeaway from this, right? Okay, uh, obviously people say, uh, well, you make it distributed, so maybe sacrifice single node performance. Well, we compared it, and, and we have a structured data set, so why don't we compare against a, 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 a SQL database, single node SQL database such as MySQL, right? So those are comparisons against uh, uh, MySQL on structured data using the standard YCSB workload A, workload B. In this case, the buffer cache actually contained the entire database. This was some 10 gigabytes or something like that, not, not really big. But the buffer cache actually contained the entire database in MySQL, so this is again a memory-to-memory -memory comparisons, MySQL versus Ampool, all right? So just taking a closer look, different parts of Ampool. Ampool core is powered by Geode, right? And then there are two extensions, or the, 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 the earlier the extensible architecture that I showed you, the top-level extensions and the bottom-level extensions. The top level extensions are essentially the query layers that can query the data in Ampool or ingest data into Ampool, right? So we have Hive, Kafka, Spark, Apache Trafodian is an OLTP uh, engine, transactional OLTP engine, and uh, with, uh, along with Java, uh, Java and REST, right? As the data gets older or gets cooler, I would say, from Ampool, it's not ex getting access to a lot more, then we can actually tear it down to local file system, we can tear it down to databases, we can tear it down to HDFS or S3, right? So that was another big change that we had to make in, uh, in order to uh, get Ampool integrated nicely into the entire, or Geo integrated in, uh, uh, nicely into this ecosystem, is uh, remove the dependence on the file system itself. S3 is not a file system. S3 is an object store. So you can actually use it properly when you use with the object store API, right? Database is not an, a, a file system. It's available through the JDBC or ODBC uh, uh, queries, right? Okay, so the main changes in Ampool as compared to Geode, we are all familiar with the Geode regions. 
those are still intact. The partition regions in particular is, is what we use for everything else, right? The two table abstractions that we added are called M table and F table, right? And again, now my engineering background and not marketing background <laughs> is, is, is showing here is that M table stands for mutable tables and F table stands for flowing tables, right? Mutable tables are things that where we know things are going to change. So if you are familiar with data warehousing technologies, M tables translate to your dimension tables, typically, right? And F tables translate to your fact tables, where once the data gets in, it does not get changed ever, or maybe in a bulk mutable fashion, but not row by row, right? So we have optimized abstractions both for the mutable tables as well as the uh, flowing or fact tables, right? So data ingestion capabilities, these are all extensions added on top of that. Nothing special is done inside of Ampool in order to uh, make, make these connectors possible, right? These are completely done on top of our Java APIs. So Ampool can be used as a Kafka sync. So if you already have Kafka in your data infrastructure, you basically just say, uh, tell Ampool that, hey, this particular Kafka topic, I want you to materialize it inside of Ampool. Nothing else needs to be done. Connect it with Kafka Connect, and then we basically start absorbing data from there and push it into Ampool, right? Obviously, you have the Java and REST, RESTful APIs. Uh, Spark uh, is, is one of the very uh, commonly used analytical frameworks these days, especially for machine learning applications and AI, et cetera. So the integration with Spark for Ampool, all the Ampool tables, whether there are M tables, regions, or F tables, actually appear as data frames in Spark. So anything that you uh, uh, operate on Spark today by converting Hadoop-based uh, uh, files into data frames and operating on them using Spark, you can actually operate on top of Ampool tables themselves. The only two line changes, load from Ampool and store into Ampool, nothing else, nothing else in between actually changes. Right? All right, for uh, other data processing options, we basically are also supporting Hive as an as a analytical SQL engine. Uh, Spark as a machine learning and, and Spark SQL uh, engine, and Python and R as standalone applications which can basically talk to Ampool. And, and in Python, uh, Ampool tables appear as Pandas data frames, and in R, they have a, a notion of data frames that uh, are, are frames that we basically uh, uh, expose our Ampool tables as. For the bottom level extensions, which are the data persistence capabilities, uh, local file system, which was already there in Geode, we have made some modifications or some optimizations in there uh, that, uh, that allow you to uh, 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 more optimized way of storing structured data because M tables are semi-structured data, I would say. Uh, then for the mutable tables where the updates are happening in place, we allow change data capture mechanism, a slight uh, uh, variation on the async event queue, but, uh, but uh, that's essentially what it is. Right? And for F table, which is the fact table, which does not have to be changed very often or uh, does not have to be changed or updated uh, row by row, we basically create ORC or Parquet files on local disk and on HDFS as extension of the, of the Ampool memory table. Right? The assumption is that the data that has been ingested into the F table recently will be accessed most often or, or is needed at the lowest latency. That remains in memory. And as the, as the data essentially ages, it goes to the local file systems and then from the local file system onto HDFS or S3, et cetera, in the ORC format. Ampool is identically deployed. I mean, in terms of, uh, as compared to Geode, it's ex the deployment is identical. You basically have a bunch of locators and you have a bunch of servers which talk, uh, uh, I mean, peer -to with the peer-to-peer -peer communication. The clients can be outside of the Ampool cluster or for high throughput applications that you need, the clients could be running directly on the Ampool cluster. You, could ha you would have to uh, uh, spare some memory for the clients. That's pretty much the only uh, difference. Right? Another approach that we took is basically we did not uh, uh, you know, reinvent the wheel in terms of deployment, management, and monitoring. Thanks to the extensive JMX support in, uh, in Geode, we basically just use that in order to connect with whatever the customer is actually using for ma monitoring and, and management. Right? Uh, in addition, for the deployment part, because we are uh, typically deployed very close to, if not on the Hadoop system, we uh, uh, additionally added uh, uh, deployment options with Cloudera Manager and Apache Ambari, which is used in the Hortonworks data platform. Okay? So where are we going from here? Right? So event-driven architectures is, is uh, 
is, is touted to be the next wave of, of, of building, building uh, the data-driven applications, right? And this uh, diagram is actually borrowed from uh, Richard Siroter from Pivotal. It's a, it's a great blog post. You should uh, all, all read about it, right? He essentially uh, uh, splits the event-driven architectures into five layers, which are, again, independent of each other and a common uh, uh, layer, which actually manages all of that uh, together, right? The events are getting generated from various applications, various uh, uh, front ends. Uh, events are transported using various ways. Then events uh, are, are processed in different manners using stream processing engines or, or, or uh, several other, other things, right? And then the events essentially contain that data that needs to be analyzed, and the results of those analy uh, analytics need to be served back. And for all these, there needs to be a common runtime. Right? So that's sort of the essence of the event-driven architecture. So what we intend to do is to simplify this event, event architecture by combining those two layers, the event processing engines and the analytics and serving part into a single manageable platform. Okay? So what do we do for analytics and service? We basically have uh, a bunch of connectors, as, as you saw in the top level connectors that we have implemented, which can allow Ampool to be used as a stream broker, as state caches, relational database, uh, NoSQL database, even, even a data warehouse, at least the fast data warehouse part, right? And as uh, uh, a machine learning training platforms. Ampool also has enough features in there, some, some of them borrowed from Apache Geode, and some of those we have implemented, that allow you to uh, uh, allow us to be used as a web backend, stream processing engines with various stream processing uh, 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 engines connectors, uh, fast batching, uh, and micro batching. Right? So to summarize, you can use Ampool to create an analytical foundation for the apps, enabling near application analytics, near app analytics. You can reduce operations complexity if you're using three or four different components, one for analytics, one for serving, one as caching. You can use only one single Ampool cluster for all of that. And you can actually get the in-memory processing speed up. So if performance is your problem, then just go with the in-memory feature and you're you know, good. So uh, oh, uh, one more thing. So as of today, uh, we have decided to open source uh, the Ampool Active Data Store. Uh, we started this project with uh, a code name called Monarch. Uh, and obviously, being engineers, we want to expand Monarch into what it could be. So it's M by N architecture or memory-oriented new architecture or something like that. right? But that's the code name of the project, and that's the project name in the open source. Available under <coughs> the Apache uh, uh, license v2. Uh, includes several connectors, Spark, Hive, as I mentioned. Uh, PrestoDB, which is uh, one of the uh, faster uh, SQL engine that uh, Facebook has open sourced and Teradata is supporting. Uh, Apache Kafka as Apache Kafka Sync, R and Python. Uh, we welcome contributions. Try it out. Uh, it's, uh, it's there uh, on, the, on the Ampool organization project name called, called uh, Monarch. Uh, the second announcement, it is actually available on AWS Marketplace as of last week. So the single uh, node uh, or single uh, node AMI is, is going to be forever going to be free. Obviously, you have to change charge. Uh, the, the Amazon will charge you for EC2. Uh, Multi-node Ampool cluster is our production tested uh, uh, cluster single node deployment with auto scaling functionality. Currently, we have tested it uh, for performance reasons, etc., only for M3 dot extra uh, two extra large instances, uh, and we don't require EBS. In fact, we forbid people from using EBS. We we want them to use uh, local SSD storage. Uh, it's currently available only in the US East one, Virginia, and US uh, West uh, region. Uh, uh, there is a there is a free trial period. Uh, what are we working on? We are working on our 2.0 version, which should come up uh, uh, before, uh, which should be released before uh, end of this year. So the big new feature in there is columnar support uh, for in-memory layouts, and uh, this required a lot of changes to uh, to to Geode in order to actually twist it, the row-oriented nature of the key-value pairs, into a columnar store. So that's that's going to be out there in 2.0. 
But with the columnar store, and uh, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the ORC or, or uh, row columnar structure, that's what it actually supports. Uh, with that, we have support for partition pruning. So if you have multiple days of data stored there and you want to analyze just one day's worth of data, you don't have to do the entire scan. You can actually uh, uh, do the filter pushdowns really nicely. We have the new Presto DB connector and uh, 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 taking Christian's uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, example, we have added a Apache CalSight connector as well. The way he implements it is he, he translates it into OQL and gets it executed inside of, uh, 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 inside of Geode. In this case, we actually make the Java call. So we do more modifications to the CalSight connector in order to actually generate an optimized uh, plan to execute it on top of, uh, on top of Ample. All right, so that's pretty much what I have. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, links here. You can download the tar file or, or RPM. The, uh, the open source code is there. Single node AMI and multi-node clusters are available from AWS Marketplace. Documentation, unfortunately, is not on our ample.io site for different reason. It's actually ample-inc.com, so you can uh, check it out. Uh, send us an email. We would love to uh, uh, discuss uh, 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 any roadmap items or, or anything that you want from Ample.